Lord, we welcome you into this place. We ask that your spirit would be poured out upon us and refresh us anew. That you would open our ears and our hearts to receive your word and your message for us, Lord, for you to speak to us, whether it has anything to do with the sermon or anything else that we've heard today. Lord, it just might be, it just might be that you've called us to this place that we would stop, that we would discontinue all of the doing and that in this moment we would simply be human beings here dwelling in the presence of God. We pray and ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen and amen. Well, good morning again, church. Good to be in worship uh, with you. How many of you are glad that school is back? Like four of you. How many of you wish it was still summer? Wow. Usually on that first one, the parents are like, their hands are way up in the air. Yes, we're happy. Oh, my gosh. What a great time to begin anew as we face a new school year and all the rhythms and things about that. If you have your Bibles, if you would uh, turn them on or you can use an old school one like mine, we're going to be reading from Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Colossians 3, 1 through 3. Hear these words. Since then you've been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. We're continuing our sermon series called In the Way. Uh, and it has kind of a double meaning. But in this series, we've been exploring the different spiritual disciplines We've talked about celebration, we've talked about uh, worship, we've talked about study, we've talked about prayer, we've talked about a variety of things, uh, different spiritual practices that help us to get in a rhythm whereby we can hear from God. We are used to in life different rhythms uh, associated around different things and what we want to do in spiritual disciplines is it they're like doorways that lead us into the presence of God. And so in the way comes from this idea that Jesus, uh, is, his followers were called followers of the way. Jesus says in John's gospel, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So he was the way to the Father. And so his followers were called followers of the way. And this picture of a path is kind of meant to remind us that we are following Christ along the way and that we are walking after him. The second thing it does is kind of the, a counterintuitive if, is this, that if we are adopting spiritual practices, if we are trying to follow Christ, it is going to get in the way of other things. It is inevitable. It is going to uh, cause inconveniences for our normal rhythms of life. It might even challenge us to give up things in order to more fully follow Christ. So it gets in the way as it's supposed to do. As it's supposed to do. So that gives you a picture. And here in the book of Colossians, Paul is writing to the Christians in the city of Colossae. And he is writing about a heresy that is developing there. We don't know exactly what it was. We know some of the characteristics of it. And in chapter 1, Paul begins by giving thanks for uh, the God restoring and renewing uh, the Colossians and, and bringing them in through the gospel to the life that we have in Christ. And in chapter 2, he begins to kind of speak against 
whatever this was that kind of seemed to be synchronistic. In other words, it, it pulled from different religions or different beliefs to, to kind of adopt a synchronistic or combined uh, faith of, of, in whatever deity or deities that there were. And so Paul addresses that and says, you came out of that world. You're no longer part of that world. You have, in a sense, died to it. So don't go back. Don't go back into that life. There is a shift that takes place there. Uh, in Ephesians chapter 2, Paul is talking to the church in Ephesus, and he talks about putting off the old man and putting on the new, putting off the old garments and putting on the new, an act of leaving the old behind, but then adopting the new. It doesn't do much good if you give something up if you don't put something else in its place that is better. And so that's what Paul is writing about in Colossians 1, or Colossians 3, 1 through 3. He's talking about where we set our focus and our attention. If you're like me, when you were growing up, your parents would often say things like, focus, snap, to, to get me out of whatever trance I was in. Or they would say, pay attention. Pay attention. My mother was very big on this. Uh, and if she's watching, I love you, mom. She was very big on this. She wanted me to look her in the eyes when she talked to me. So if I was off doing something else and she began to talk, she would say, Adam, pay attention. Look at me when I'm talking to you. Look at me. Because for her, it was important that we connected and that I was on the same wavelength and focused in on what she was doing. And that's because as a child, whenever there was a shiny object, I'm gone. I'm off somewhere else. And so for her, she taught me that there is respectful to look people in the eyes when you talk to them. She did not tell me not that she didn't tell me about the danger of looking introverts in the eyes that makes them run away. They're afraid. She didn't tell me about that part of it. But she did say when people, when you're talking to people, give them your full attention. And so we in turn trained our kids the same way. We would have our kids look at us when we were talking to them. It's important that you fix your eyes or train your focus is what Paul is saying here. Listen to those words again. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your mind, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. For you're, you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Paul there is telling us two things, telling us two things to do. To set our hearts on the things of God and to set our minds on the things of God. Our affections, our focus. In Deuteronomy 6, the Israelites were told, uh, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your might, with all your strength. Meaning every part of your will, every part of what it means to be human is to be fixed upon and focused upon following after the Lord. So Paul here is hearkening back to that. He's also in the beginning hearkening back to chapter 2 verse 12 where he explains to the Colossians that when we're baptized, we're baptized into death, raised into resurrection life, and we're called to live in that. Meaning this, that when we are baptized, when we undergo that ritual that is a picture of what Christ is doing on the inside of us, then in that moment, we are living in eternal life. It's not as we might suppose that when we die and pass from this life to the next, that that's when we enter into eternity. No, according to Paul, that happens when we are baptized. That is the picture that takes place, that we are baptized into Christ's death. We are raised into his life, and now Christ lives in us, and we are hidden with Christ in God. We are in eternal life now. You right now, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, have entered into eternal life. Right now, 
in this moment, you are living in eternity for all time. And because of that, Paul tells the Colossians that you should live as if that is a reality. And if you are living in eternal life, you will not live the ways that you used to. You will not adopt the rhythms and the patterns of life that you used to. But instead, you will be focused on Christ. That, that word that he uses is the word meditate. Meditate. We've been talking about the different types of spiritual disciplines. And this week we're talking about meditation. Meditation. What does it mean to meditate on God? Well, if we're going to think about that, it's good that we know what the scriptures have to say, how they define meditation. There's a couple of things that, that the scriptures tell us. First, in the Old Testament, that word meditation, there are several different words, two in particular, that in the Hebrew, the original language of the Old Testament, is used to describe this idea of meditation. So the first word is a word called Hagah in Hebrew, and that simply means this. It means to whisper or murmur. Here, here's the picture of that. It's this idea that when we're focused on something, we sometimes talk to ourselves, or we say things to help us memorize them. When we're trying to get the words of a speech or perhaps memorizing scripture or reminding ourselves of something, we will say it over and over and over again. It might look something like this. We, we kind of are thinking. We don't want to write it down. We're in a hurry. And so we say, don't forget the eggs. Don't forget the eggs. Don't forget the eggs. Don't forget the eggs. And we continually say that. We meditate on it. That's what that means. It means we murmur it to ourselves. Or maybe when we're going through a difficult time, we have to remind ourselves that despite our circumstances, that God is faithful and good, even if we can't see it. And so we say to ourselves, God, I know you're good. I know you're good. Meet me in the situation. God, I know you're good. Meet me in the situation. We whisper or murmur it over. That's a type of meditation. That's what it means to meditate using that word in Hebrew, Hagah. It's a picture of Psalm 1-2 when the psalmist is describing uh, the righteous individual or person. How blessed is the man who follows after God with his whole heart. He meditates on his law day and night. That's that word. Or in Joshua 1-8 when they are entering into the land, Moses uh, the servant of the Lord has brought them to this point. He's not entering in. He's passed away. And so they are moving into the land. And what does God say? He says to remind them of the covenant that they would meditate on it as they enter into the land. That they would meditate on God's word. There's another word called siyak in Hebrew. And that word means to lovingly rehearse or go over in one's mind. To lovingly rehearse, to something that we love, that we keep playing it over in our mind. I think of, of my son and daughter's wedding day. I rehearse that in my head from time to time and remember how wonderful it was and the great time that was had and how it changed everyone's life. And I, I am rehearsing that lovingly because I, I want to remember and savor that moment. There are moments in my life where, where God seemed to meet me in ways that he never had before when the space between heaven and earth was very thin and it was as if God was in the room with me and I meditate on those. I think about those lovingly, not to forget them. We have moments like that, that that takes place. That's what that word meditate means. And in this and in the New Testament, we find that the word that Paul uses here is a Greek word because the New Testament was written primarily in Greek. And that word is logizomai. Say that five times fast at a party. But the basic thing is this. Here in Colossians 3, drawing on that tradition of what it means to meditate in the Old Testament, Paul talks and uses a word that means to think, to consider, or dwell on. And so we have this rich picture of what meditate means from a biblical perspective. 
Now, if you're like me, when you were maybe first introduced to that word, or maybe even now, you, you associate meditate with some Eastern practice. You, you think about people meditating to empty themselves, maybe in Buddhism, or more, maybe Taoism, or maybe Hinduism. You think about this idea of sitting alone in quiet, maybe humming, maybe chanting a word, maybe saying nothing. Uh, you, you have pictures of what that means but that's not what the scriptures are talking about. Meditation from a biblical standpoint is not simply the absence of everything and sitting in calm. It's not even lighting candles, sitting on a rug, listening to relaxing music. That might, as appealing as that might be, that's not what meditation means from a biblical perspective. You see, Eastern meditation is concerned with the emptying of oneself. With being in a place where you are, you are no longer mindful, that you are not distracted in any way by outside influences, that you are trying to get to a state of nothingness. That's the kind of the goal of Eastern meditation. But the, the practice from a biblical standpoint is the emptying of oneself and the filling of oneself with Christ. It's the, it's the pursuit of not mindlessness, but mindfulness. And the mindfulness is around the things of God, focusing and considering and thinking about the things of God. That's why Paul says, keep seeking and set or fix your mind on heavenly things. It means that our perspective and our focus and the thing which governs how we behave is based not on external circumstances, but rather our fixation or focus on Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example of how that's important. I don't know if you know this, but we are in a presidential election season. I know you probably have just been doing your thing and have no idea what I'm talking about. But we are in that season and there is all kinds of messaging that is trying, that has been sent at us to grab a hold of us and fix our attention on it. In fact, there are all different views about what is best for the country, the world, my personal circumstances, etc. and so on ad nauseum. There is an attempt to pull us away and to help us focus on that. But it is not irresponsible to say, while I am aware of that, that my focus is on the Lord of all creation, the one who rules heaven and earth. It is not the nations or governments that rule the heavens and the earth. And therefore, I will focus my life on who Christ is, not who our president is. That's the focus. That's the, the reason, that's the meditation that we should be focused on. It is Christ who rules the nations. And therefore, we are to focus on him and look at the world through the kingdom of heaven's viewpoint. That's the picture. Well, it's going to take something to get to that place to be able to meditate. Because meditation is about unlearning patterns of life. And relearning. This isn't foreign to us. We do this in a lot of different ways. One of the best pieces of advice I ever got when I graduated uh, from college was a guy sat me down and he said, Now I want you to know everything you've learned about ministry, all the biblical knowledge that you have, all the ways that they told you how to conduct yourself and what to do. I want you just to take all of that and just throw it right out the window. Because when you roll into a church, you're going to have to learn their patterns. You're going to have to learn who they are. You're going to have to understand what's important to them, what the expectations are. And everything that you learn, while important and good, is going to have to take a back seat to how they understand that practice. You do that anytime you go into a new job. Well, I have an engineering degree. I have an accounting degree. I, I'm a lawyer, attorney. I, I, I'm a doctor, medical professional. I, I'm a nurse. Yes, all of those things are important. But then you have to learn how they do it. You have to adapt yourself to how they do things or perhaps not. Maybe you say, I, I can't get with this. This is not a pattern of life. So you have to relearn. And you may have done things at a job over here. But now you're at this job 
And it's different than the other. In fact, you know this probably better than I do. To say, you know, when I was at this place, this is how we did it, is like the end of your career. They don't care about that. So we have to unlearn how we've lived life according to the pattern of this world. And we have to relearn what it means to follow with Christ. And that's going to to really upend our life. Things, the things of God are going to get in the way of the things of this world. It will happen. Discipleship is something like this. Learning how to detach uh, ourselves from one master to serve a better one. Learning how to do things not the old way but in a new way. And the old practices and the old patterns we have to let go of. And when they knock on the door and when they ring the doorbell, we need to turn off the lights and not answer and not go back to how things were, but step into how things are. We talked about it's not an emptying or filling, uh, emptying of the mind, but a filling of the mind with Christ. If we want to look at maybe a working definition of meditation, I think Richard Foster, who wrote the book, The Celebration of Discipline on the the, uh, Spiritual Disciplines, he has a great and very simple definition. He says that meditation, very simply, is the ability to hear God's voice and obey His word. That's, That's the aim. Meditation is something that we practice in order that we can hear God's voice and obey his word. We can make it more complicated if we like, but that's how simple it really is. The reason we meditate on the things of God, that we meditate on the scripture, is so that we will begin to think in the ways of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus went about teaching people what the kingdom of heaven was like, to how to think and live according to the pattern that God established long ago instead of all the other patterns around them. They had forgotten it. And Jesus came to remind them of that pattern over and over again of how to live into that kind of life. It's about actually, hear this, meditation is about actually becoming Christian in character, fully human beings who learn how to live the Christian life individually and corporately. I want to say that again. Meditation is about actually becoming Christian in character, fully human beings who learn how to live the Christian life individually and corporately. It helps us to recognize that the world is ruled by God, not nations. And I love this. And the political task of the church is the formation of people who see clearly the cost of discipleship and are willing to pay the price. Our only political concerns are in becoming the people God has called us to be. To be formed into the image of his son. To live life in such a way that we understand what the cost is and we're willing to pay the price. That's the agenda of meditation. That's the purpose of it. That's what we're called to if we follow Christ. To follow him in the way of godliness. I want to leave you with this one story about maybe how this works practically and how it functions I have this app that I follow that's really good. It's called Lectio 365, and it's a prayer app, and uh, I highly encourage you to do it. It has 8 to 11-minute prayers in the morning and the evening. It's a great way to begin your time with the Lord every day. Very short, but it is amazing to me how even sitting still and listening and trying to, to really meditate on on the things and the word of God that it brings forth is so difficult because I'm like thinking I need to go do this and I need to go do that and I got to get at this and and they're all important things that's the problem it's not like bad stuff it's all things that we need to be doing but 
but it helps, us to fo- helps me to focus. Well, in that app, there's a morning and evening version. In the morning version, earlier this week, Monday or Tuesday, I think it was, uh, there was a particular meditation, and it was about Acts chapter 2, and when the church was coming into being, and it describes the pattern in Acts chapter 2 of how that church functioned. It says that they... They had a broke bread together, that they met together in the temple courts, that they went to worship together, and that if anybody had a need, they sold or gave of themselves to help provide for that need. It was an incredible picture. And what the person said that stuck with me is she said in the meditation that the words, and part of what Lectio does, it's based off Lectio Divina, which is a, it's a, a spiritual contemplative practice to help us focus on the scripture and listen for the words that God brings forth. And she said when she was listening that she heard two words that defined the church for her, and that is temple and table. Temple and table. What she meant by that is that they worshiped together, And they broke bread together. That they were in each other's homes. That they were sharing meals. That they were talking about what God had done in their life. And they went and worshipped together. That the rhythm and life of the church was temple and table. Temple and table. And I'm still thinking about that even today. Because I've been meditating on it all week long, thinking about it, going back to it, remembering it, asking, wondering what that might look like in this congregation, wondering how that might be a part of my practice of life. That is meditation of thinking and dwelling on things. We probably meditate a lot more than we think we do. I know we do when it comes to problems. We just take those things and just really meditate on them and work them sideways and angles and this and all that, probably much more than we ever should. But what would happen to us if we began to meditate on who God is? If that became the normal pattern of our life, it would change us. It's a little scary, isn't it? Because we know our life's patterns now and we may not like them, but we've gotten used to them. But this is something entirely different that could take us in a direction that that we're uncomfortable with. We're not used to. But it holds possibility of who we could become as followers of Christ. May the Lord Jesus Christ make us a people who lovingly meditates on Him and His words every day, every week, every month, every year. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, let's pray. May the Lord Jesus Christ be on your mind all the time. May you look at life through his eyes. May you live life the way that he calls you to live life. And may you meditate on the things of God at the expense of the old rhythms of life. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.